Hey guys, Tyler here. Phasers are one of the most iconic pieces of technology in Star Trek, a common standard sidearm in the arsenal of Starfleet and other spacefaring powers. Phasers are what we'd call directed energy weapons. They inflict damage via a beam or pulse of electromagnetic radiation, or high energy particles. Introduced in Starfleet during the 23rd century, both phasers and disruptors, a higher powered weapons class, super preceded projectile weapons, which were considered more primitive. While most phasers are classified as particle weapons, others are classified as plasma weapons and utilize a completely different form of energy. Regardless, phasers can pack a powerful punch with settings ranging from a light stun to, well, vaporize and everything in between. But how can a handheld weapon like this store so much energy and inflict so much damage? In this video, I'll attempt to answer that and other questions using both in-universe and real-world scientific concepts. So without further ado, let's get started. Before there were phasers, a wide variety of other energy weapons were used by humans during the 22nd century. One standard issue sidearm used by both Starfleet and the Earth Cargo Service during this period was the EM-33 pistol. The EM, of course, stands for electromagnetism, which is for some reason, one of the most difficult words for me to say in daily life. We see in other Trek shows that electromagnetic pulses are used to disable enemy weapons, disrupt sensor grids, jam communications, and even trigger solar flares. But based on the special effects for the Enterprise pilot Broken Bow, the ammunition the EM pistols use is actually the plasma bullet, later identified in Shadows of Pajem. Indeed, the full name of the EM-33 is the EM-33 plasma pistol. Rick Berman and Brandon Braga both stated that they intended the EM-33 to be a type of pulse gun, the same class that includes plasma rifles. These plasma weapons are shown to be not particularly high yield, but still more than capable of killing a target. They seem to be an intermediary step between traditional projectile weapons and phase weapons. As the name suggests, plasma weapons fire a bolt or stream of plasma, an excited state of matter that consists of ionized gas. Plasma is the most abundant form of ordinary matter in the universe, and it's usually associated with stars. Other common generators of plasma include lightning strikes, but it can be artificially generated by subjecting a neutral gas to heat or electric current, such as in neon signs. In Star Trek, plasma is used to channel power to systems aboard a starship, and it can be stored in canisters or infusers before being installed in plasma weapons. Even in the early seasons of Enterprise, though, we see that some plasma weapons, like the EM-33, have already fallen out of favor by the 2150s. The EM-33 in particular has the disadvantage of the user having to compensate for particle drift. Even after the EM-33 and its ship-mounted counterpart, the plasma cannon are phased out, other plasma weapons, like pulse rifles, do stick around. But the primary replacement for EM pistols and the like appear to be phase-modulated energy weapons, or phase weapons. Besides phase cannons mounted on starship hulls, handheld phase weapons generally come in two varieties, particle rifles and phase pistols. Used by both Starfleet and MAKO personnel, these weapons use a phase modulator to control the blast yield. While particle weapons in the 22nd century do seem to operate under the same general principles as later phasers, that is, bombarding a target with a stream of highly charged particles, the main differences seem to be general energy output and maximum damage. Phase pistols have a particle yield that is generally kept under 5 megajoules, although it can be set as high as 10 megajoules. Now, if you're like me, saying X number of megajoules doesn't really conjure up anything specific, so here are some examples. 5 megajoules is higher than the energy released by the explosion of 1 kilogram of TNT, enough to destroy or even obliterate a small vehicle. Furthermore, the NX-01's phase cannons have a maximum yield of 500 gigajoules, equivalent to the yield of the 2020 Beirut explosion. This event killed at least 280 
118 people, injured over 7,000, and further displaced another 300,000, and it caused $15 billion in property damage. Okay, before this gets too out of hand, let's rein things in a bit. We've talked about the yields of phase pistols and pulse rifles and all that good stuff, but besides power output, what are the other differences between 22nd century phase weapons and 23rd century phase weapons? enough to warrant an entirely different name. As it turns out, one of the other major characteristics that separates the two is the type of particle used in the blast stream. Don't cross the streams. Typical Starfleet phasers invented in the 23rd century and still used in the 24th century, known as Type II phasers, are nadion-based particle weapons. The nadion is a fictitious subatomic particle that, according to the Star Trek The Next Generation technical manual, is capable of liberating atomic nuclei. The manual indicates that phasers emit a beam of nadions that is refracted through superconducting crystals, much in the same way that a dilithium crystal can regulate the matter-antimatter reaction in a starship's warp core. As far as power output, as far as I can tell, we're never explicitly told what exactly the maximum yield is of a standard issue phaser, but phase rifles, or type 3 phasers, can output 1.05 megajoules per second. Type 3 phasers also have 16 power settings, including the classic stun and kill. They also have fully autonomous recharge capability, multiple target acquisition, and gyro stabilization. The much smaller Type 1 phaser, which is often used as a concealed carry option on more diplomatic missions, has 8 power settings that also include stun and kill. Type 1s are also much less powerful. For example, in the 23rd century, Type 1s lack sufficient power output to seriously harm a silicon-based life form, such as a Horta. Additionally, 24th century Type 1s can be programmed to automatically fire at set intervals. Oh, and uh, unlike the phase pistols of the 22nd century, all of these more advanced phase weapons have the capability of vaporizing a person. Another pressing question remains though, one that in large part motivated me to make this video in the first place. How is it possible for handheld weapons like phasers or even phaser rifles to have such a staggering yield? Keep in mind the analogies that I drew on earlier when discussing the output of phase pistols and phase cannons. These weapons operating in the multi-megajoule range may seem like a pipe dream, especially given that current efforts to produce weapons weapons of this magnitude often involve industrial-sized devices like railguns. Case in point, in my research, two particular projects caught my eye, the United States Air Force Research Laboratory's Marauder and the U.S. Navy's various experiments with laser weapons. Now, I should note that current laser weapons do have their limits. For example, the Navy's XN1 laser weapon has a yield of only 30 kilowatts less than 3% the yield of a regular phaser, and concepts for 60 and 100 kilowatt upgrades still pale in comparison to their futuristic counterparts. This is why even in the 1960s, the writers of forward-looking sci-fi like Star Trek had the foresight to opt for particle weapons instead of laser weapons, whose limits had already become evident by that point. And while we do see some laser weapons throughout the franchise, it's safe to assume that these are much more advanced than what we've been able to produce in real life. In fact, there's plenty of good YouTube videos about how things like the lasers in the Death Star from Star Wars would just be physically impossible to build, unless you're using new physics. But another intermediary concept, the coaxial plasma railgun, has shown some promise. As I mentioned earlier, there's the U.S. Air Force's Marauder project, and in this case, Marauder stands for Magnetically Accelerated Ring to Achieve Ultra-High Directed Energy and Radiation. Whew. My government's at least good at one thing, and it's coming up with acronyms. It was designed to accelerate plasma to as fast as 3% the speed of light, with a maximum output of, wait for it, 5 to 10 megajoules. 
nice. Now, the only problem is that, like other railgun concepts, Marauder has been stuck at the R&D stage for decades, and it's unclear whether such railguns will ever be deployed for practical military use. But initial tests pointing towards success indicate that, at the very least, the science and theory behind these weapons is sound. The U.S. Department of Defense also experimented with particle beam weapons as part of Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars program, in the 1980s. A prototype neutral hydrogen beam launched into space operated successfully for four minutes and returned to Earth intact. The weapon operated by ionizing hydrogen atoms, accelerating or neutralizing them by adding or removing electrons. The electrically charged neutral beam of high-energy protons could thus proceed in a straight line at or near the speed of light and smash into its target to damage it. The pulsed particle beam emitted by such a weapon could theoretically contain over a gigajoule of kinetic energy. As with plasma rail guns, besides initial tests in the latter half of the 20th century, it's uncertain if or when the large-scale deployment of particle weapons will ever become a reality. One reason for this? Overheating. Remember, these weapons operate in a manner similar to particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider. Particle accelerators use electromagnetic fields to accelerate and direct charged particles along a predetermined path, and they use electrostatic lenses to focus these streams to produce collisions. For example, a cathode ray tube, widely used in lots of 20th century TV and computer monitors, is a very rudimentary type of particle particle accelerator. But the types of experiments done at the LHC are meant to recreate the conditions that were present at the Big Bang, producing yields on the order of um, insane and temperatures as high as like a bajillion degrees. One application of particle weapons would be to damage or destroy a target by simply overheating it until it no longer functions, something we see quite frequently in Star Trek. But with the power to destroy your target comes the power to destroy yourself. High-powered particle accelerators are extremely massive. The LHC has a diameter, for example, of about 8.5 kilometers, with highly constricted construction, operation, and maintenance protocols. Thus, it would be very difficult to weaponize such technology in the present or near future. Difficult, but in the long term, maybe not impossible. It's perhaps a bit of a stretch, but if the miniaturization of other technologies like transistors has taught us anything, it's that if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. Wait, that's not right. If you can't stand the heat, innovate ways to manage that heat. Thermal management is arguably one of the most pressing concerns of the modern day given our reliance on electronics. Because the amount of heat output is equivalent to power output, we've had to develop techniques for cooling such as uh, heat sinks, thermoelectric coolers, fans, heat pipes, and so on. In the future, it's likely that we will continue to master engineering on increasingly smaller scales of the universe. Beyond nanotechnology lies picotechnology and femtotechnology, which refer to engineering on the scales of 10 to the minus 12 and 10 to the minus 15 meters, respectively. In theory, by the 23rd century, even as concepts like Moore's Law reach their physical limits, our material science may be advanced enough to manage the heat produced by handheld particle weapons. We could manipulate special metals to act as super advanced heat sinks or cold plates, facilitating heat dissipation to cool components of a phaser or cannon. These metals would work in conjunction Conjunction with superconducting crystals to manage the flow of nadions from the energy source to the target. This complex system of moving parts would be essential in turning the equivalent of a thermonuclear explosion into something more manageable.
Admittedly, I mainly focused on Federation weapons in this video, even though phaser technology is quite diverse among various alien races. But the bare bones, basic principles are largely the same across different cultures. Hopefully this video did serve as an effective overview of just how phasers work, the tremendous power they yield, and how future materials science could allow us to build something like them in real life. Just hope you'll never see one pointed at you. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. And don't forget to set your phasers on stun.